Good morning, dear pilgrims. I am so glad to see you here on this beautiful spring morning. I also want to say to you all how proud I am of Pilgrim Church. I know that sin of pride is a bad one, but I am so proud of how we handled Friday night's AGO fundraiser. Thank you. Thank you, Pilgrim, for all that you did to make that happen. Thank you, Patrick. And I think they've raised over $4,000. So wonderful, wonderful news. I'm just going to be guilty of that sin of pride forever, as long as I am privileged to serve you. This morning, our service of worship is here for those of you who are able to be with us, but also we want to welcome all who are watching us online or from a distance, wherever you are. Welcome, friends. There are a couple of announcements. I see someone in the announcement pew, so would you go ahead? Good, thank you. One more announcement, and that is to tell you, remind you, for those of you who have not yet seen it, that we are hosting the memorial service for John Morrison. It's been such an honor to meet with his family, to plan the details of that service, to hear stories about him, and to know how deep in his bones was the life of Pilgrim Church. The memorial service will be this coming Saturday, April 2nd, a visitation at 10 and the service at 11. Now let us greet one another with the signs and the words of peace. May peace be with you. Please remain standing. Will you please join me now in our responsive call to worship? 
Happy are those whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. When I acknowledged my sin to you, O God, and did not hide my iniquity, let all the faithful offer prayers to you. Let us pray. Dear God, we are so grateful to enter this sacred and beautiful sanctuary. Joy our hearts in this dear place. Here we see you face to face. We offer our prayer to you, for here we know we are forgiven. Hear the song of our hearts, we ask. Amen.
seated. Today's scripture reading comes from the Gospel according to Luke, chapter 15. Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to him, and the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, This fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. There was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. So he divided his property between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all he had and traveled to a distant country. And there he squandered his property in dissolute living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. He would gladly have uh, filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired hands have bread enough and to spare, but here I am dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he set off and went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. Then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly, bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. And get the fatted calf and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now, his elder son was in the field, and when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. He called one of the slaves and asked what was going on. He replied, Your brother has come, and your father has killed the fatted calf, because he has got him back safe and sound. Then he became angry and refused to go in. His father came out and began to plead with him. But he answered his father, Listen, for all these years I have been working like a slave for you, and I have never disobeyed your command. Yet you have never given me even a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when the son of yours came back, who has devoured your property with prostitutes? You killed the fatted calf for him. Then the father said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we have had to celebrate and rejoice, because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost and has been found. So ends the reading. I would like to invite some children or some children in heart to come down here because I have one of my favorite stories to tell you. Good morning. Aha, a spring hat. I love it. So, hello. I am going to tell you a story about a brother and a sister. You have a brother? Do you have a sister? See, we already are halfway there. The brother and the sister were both farmers, and they had farms that were right next to each other. The sister was all by herself. She was not married, she didn't have any children. She was happy as could be growing wheat on her farm. Even living by herself, she could, well, she could have cereal for dinner. She could get up whenever she wanted to. She loved living by herself. But 
the farm was a lot of work. Over here, the brother also grew wheat on his farm. He was married and had seven children, a big family. He loved having children around, and he loved his wife, and he loved his life, and he felt sorry for his sister who lived all by herself. These two loved each other very much, and they worried about each other all the time. The sister thought to herself, my poor brother, all those mouths to feed, all those kids, he's so busy with his family, how can he possibly keep up with his farming? I know, I'll take some of my wheat and put it over in his barn, and then he won't have to work so hard because he'll have plenty of wheat. But he can't know I've done that because his pride will not let him accept it. So in the middle of the night, she loaded up a big cart full of wheat. She tiptoed through the fields and into her brother's barn and delivered the wheat. In the morning, when he checked his barn, he said, whoa, look at all this wheat. I didn't realize that my kids had done so much work for me. Oh, my poor sister, all by herself. She has to hire workers. She doesn't have kids around to help her. I don't know what I could do for her. I know I'll take some of my wheat, since I have so much, and put it in her barn, and that way she won't have to work so hard. But my sister has a lot of pride, so she can't know that I've done this. So he waited until the middle of the night, he loaded up his cart, and he snuck over to his sister's barn, and he unloaded his wheat. In the morning, she said, wait, where did all this wheat come from? I thought I'd given it to my brother. Maybe I just imagined that. I know, I'll take some to him, and that way he'll have any more. Middle of the night, piled it onto a cart, sneaks over to her brother's barn, gives him the wheat. Next morning, brother sees the wheat. I have so much. God has blessed me beyond measure. My poor sister, all by herself. She doesn't have enough to get by. I have all this wheat. But she's proud, so I better wait until the night to not let her know that I've done this. So he loaded up his wheat into a cart, and at midnight, sneak, 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 sneak. Well, this went on night after night after night, and they never realized what was happening. Then, one night, they got their nights kind of mixed up, and the sister loaded up her wheat, and the brother loaded up his wheat, and they snuck in the night, and they snuck in the night, and they found each other carrying wheat to each other's barns. That's how all that wheat kept appearing in their barns. And God saw how much that sister and brother loved each other and how much they had to give to one another. And right in that very place, God built Pilgrim Church. <laughs> Can we have a prayer? Thank you so much that you love us and you love us as we love one another. Help us to continue to be generous, not only to our sisters and brothers, but to even strangers. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, you may go to the sunroom.
kind of story from scripture is very familiar, like the one Julie read about the prodigal son and his resentful brother and their forgiving father. It's hard to hear it as if we were hearing it for the first time. With the ears of those who heard it first from Jesus himself. The story, because of its strong images and richly drawn characters, sticks in our minds. We know that young prodigal, don't we? Maybe we were him. We know the compulsion that caused him to strike out on his own. We recognize the fun he had spending his inheritance, and we empathize with his despair when he realized his stupidity. And we like him, too, especially when he figured out how foolish he had been and when he returned to ask his father for forgiveness. As I was looking this past week for artwork for the front of today's bulletin, nearly every single image I could find, and I looked probably at 30 or 40, showed some version or another of the prodigal, announcing that he would be leaving, spending money in profligate and unseemly ways, feeding pigs. The photo I chose by Jeff Babbitt at least depicts both brothers, though it's pretty clear which one is the prodigal, the one with two women behind him. Which actually leads us to the older brother, who we also know, face pinched into a dutiful expression, quiet, steady, hardworking, conscientious, a little bit of a martyr, we know exactly how he felt when his brother came home and got a party. We understand his resentment and his anger. We know what motivates him to work so hard, what deep suffices he no doubt has had of their children would we identify with the prodigal son. There's just something about him I'm drawn to something rebellious and independent, reckless even, that attracts us and entertains us a little bit and makes us want to pretend that we're like him, only we're just a little bit more restrained. Of course, the prodigal, at least to my mind, is a more appealing figure than his dutiful brother, but that's because in my family, I was the prodigal. The brother wouldn't have been appealing to Jesus' original audience. He would have been just what he appears to be at first glance, resentful. And the prodigal, short-sighted and self-indulgent. Jesus described people that every one of those first listening ears would recognize. There wouldn't have been any sympathy for the prodigal, no understanding, no secret little attraction. In fact, the tax collectors and sinners, they recognized themselves. There would have been a lot of sympathy for the dutiful brother. The Pharisees and scribes identified themselves as cheerfully assuming the duties of their role. Jesus' first listeners would have been shocked at the father's behavior. They would not have believed that any father would act in such a way. They would have shaken their heads at the image of an old man running toward his disobedient and disloyal son to embrace him and welcome him home again. They would have made little sounds in their throats and clicking noises with their tongues at the very idea 
that the father would have sacrificed his best calf and thrown such an extravagant party for this son who should have been ignored at best, written off. They were with the brother. Oh, yes, nodding their heads at his arrival and his anger, identifying completely with his outrage, disbelieving the father's words. Those were the Pharisees and scribes. They were listening carefully. Jesus' first audience would not have realized the story was actually about them scribes and Pharisees. And it wasn't a particularly flattering portrait. They would not have recognized themselves, of course, until it was too late in the story. Jesus' first listeners would have been lulled into thinking that the story was in fact about that sinning prodigal, the wayward son, those tax collectors, those sinners, because he couldn't possibly have meant it was about them. They weren't dissolute squanderers of God's inheritance. They certainly weren't like that foolish old father, forgiving and loving that wayward boy. And the only character left to identify with was the righteous, dutiful, mistreated older brother. Yeah, that one, the brother who did things right. Only he doesn't really come out looking all that good. In fact, he looks a lot like the Pharisees and the scribes. Hmm. Don't you hate that when that happens? When it turns out Jesus is talking, you know, about us that what he's saying makes us look foolish or selfish or short-sighted. I mean, we're not prodigals. So I guess that means we're resentful. I'm pretty sure Jesus aimed this story not so much at the tax collectors and sinners that Luke tells us were coming to listen to him, even the story could have been something of a comfort to them since its message was clear. God will forgive them, run toward them, hike up his robes and embrace them and welcome them home again. Luke tells us that the Pharisees and scribes, however, were grumbling about him. They didn't like that Jesus welcomed sinners and tax collectors to his table. So Jesus told the story, well, sort of to the tax collectors and sinners, knowing that the Pharisees and scribes would be listening in, assuming that the judgment would be upon those tax collectors and sinners. pretty clear Jesus wanted his listeners to recognize themselves either identifying with the prodigal or with the resentful brother and their relative position within the circle of God's love and forgiveness. And so do we. Because we're the right audience for this story too. We are the dutiful older brother. We're the scribes and the Pharisees, the churchgoers, dutiful ones, all. And if we think Jesus told this story for someone else, well, we might should listen to it again. As I mentioned last week, the Lenten gospel readings are getting increasingly difficult the closer we get to Holy Week. They're not difficult in that they're difficult to believe or difficult to understand. Rather, they're difficult in that way to model ourselves after. They are difficult to enter 
into them with the mind of Christ, they're difficult to recognize ourselves in them. The Jesus narrative is taking us right to the heart of conflict. They're getting more pointed, those stories, even more daring. In a way, he's insulting the ones who think they're the good guys. It's as if Jesus has decided it's time to point. I know to our contemporary ears, the story of the prodigal son and his resentful brother and their forgiving father feels a little dated. It doesn't really register as the kind of story that would actually enrage people to the point of calling for a public execution. I mean, really, what's so daring about a forgiving, loving image of God? Well, only this. If you believe yourself to be one kind of a person, basking, so to speak, in the light of God's approval, and someone with genuine moral authority tells you that you are, in fact, another kind of person, and your whole life has been built upon a self-image that turns out to be somewhat cracked and distorted. One reaction might be anger. And it's going to be aimed at the one who's pointing the finger. To understand why the things Jesus said and did those last weeks of his life led directly to his death, we need to understand more about the context in which he lived. This little story, taken on its own merits, is just a story about God's generous, forgiving love, a love that is undiminished by anything humans do. The tax collectors were those Jews who colluded with Rome against the interests of their own people. They certainly would have rejoiced at hearing such a story, that God loves them, forgives them, and welcomes them home. You've been greedy. You've been a little cowardly. You sided with the enemy. God will still run toward you with open arms. But sinners aren't the only ones who hear the story. No, we righteous ones, we hear it too. We're living through a pretty harsh period in our civic national life. And I pray that it will one day be something different. It's hard to stay hopeful when so much of what I value and even revere in public discourse, community principles, institutional integrity, and individual responsibility, and common civility is being demeaned and degraded every day from the hearing halls of the Senate. Well, you know what I'm talking about. I don't know how to influence it myself, even address it in any meaningful way. So what I do, and I invite you to do, is to go back to the stories of our faith, the stories that taught me my most cherished values, stories about Solomon and Moses and Sarah, the truth Nathan told to David, and the prophecies of Jeremiah and Micah and Hosea and Isaiah, and the wisdom of Sophia, God's woman partner in creation. I think back on the stories Jesus told, parables about unjust labor practices and economic exploitation and religious rigidity, Stories about how he forgave the enemy woman at the well who had slept around 
and his friend Martha who yelled at him when he let her brother Lazarus die. And this story about two brothers, both representing our human frailty and their father. A story that was aimed at a dangerous audience and hit its target true. What kind of story would Jesus tell today, I wonder? What kind of story are we telling? What story is reminding us how we should act, how we should believe, how we should live and love and forgive, how we should fulfill God's hopes for us? I want to work on that story. I think I'll start with Jesus' story. Amen. I once heard in a sermon the preacher describing the United States as having the shortest attention span on earth. And there's a little truth to that. We go from headline to headline, recognizing that we need new thrills, new agonies, 
but there are some things that are still going on. And we need to offer our prayers for those things too. The war in Ukraine has lasted a month and already there aren't quite as many headlines about its progress. And then there's Yemen, the refugees from Afghanistan. There's a legacy of race, racism in our nation, a legacy of slavery, and sometimes it feels like old news, and yet it's still going on in different forms, but it doesn't take much to recognize them. And so we need to pray. Exploitation of all kinds is old news, but it's still going on. And so we need to pray. So let us now open our hearts to God. Please pray with me. Beloved and gracious God, you run toward us with open arms, ready to forgive. And we turn away time and time again. We ask that you would forgive us for our indifference. There's so much that we fear, so much that causes us pain and anguish, really. And so we turn away from those things, too. There are so many, many people whose lives are in danger or who have been cut short because of violence of all kinds, war and profligate gun violence, exploitation of children, And so, because it's overwhelming, we turn away from that, too. There are so many people who are suffering because they just don't have enough. And even working a number of jobs, they can't earn enough. And so, they resort to all kinds of struggling acts that are illegal, But in desperate times, they take desperate measures, and so sometimes we shake our heads, but turn away from them. We live in such a complicated world, but it is still your world. And so we need to find your grace, your moments of beauty, your kindness. Help us to be courageous ourselves. To look directly at those things that are wrong. To name them, speak truth, but also love. Help us to love. Was it not love between those two brothers that the father sought? Is it not love between us and those who are different from us that you are seeking? Help us to learn and to wonder and to hear in new ways with new ears the stories that Jesus told. For though their context is particular, their message is universal. We humbly ask that you would hear us now as we
pray together the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to say. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We have been so richly blessed. We privilege to be in worship in this sanctuary. So let us give of our treasure for the work of this church as it carries out its mission here and around the world. Our ushers will now receive the morning offering. Let us pray. God, help us to find within ourselves the strength to be generous, <clears throat> to be courageous, and the humility to confess our excuses so that we might come into your realm with open hearts. We dedicate these gifts to your service. Amen.
Look up, beloved. God is running toward us with open arms ready to forgive and to love and to welcome us home. May it always be so. Amen.